This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week, I'm speaking to gardener and writer Lula Ellender about her book, Grounding, Finding Home in a Garden. Lula's book is about tuning into the unceasing rhythms of nature in order to live with uncertainty and how they can help us become more connected to the place in which we live. We talk about how gardens can root us in time and place, even when those roots seem tenuous and liable to break. Lula began by talking about the circumstances in which she came to write the book. Yeah, so the book actually started with a kind of different heart. I was trying to write about homesickness and I wanted to explore that through the idea of um, different houses and how people's relationships to places kind of changed and it was particularly to do with this house that I'd lost as a child where we had to leave when my parents got divorced and my dad went bankrupt. But I couldn't sort of find a way into that narrative and it wasn't really working. And I kind of tried a few different things. And then I was speaking to my editor. At that point, this kind of situation had arisen with our house that we rent. And we were stuck in this horrible probate dispute between the landlord and the landlord's executors. And they wanted to sell the house and it went on the market. So this was all going on in the background and I had a chat with my editor and she said, why don't you write about the garden? Because at that point, the garden had become this kind of anchor for me to have this belief that we would still be here in this house to see the plants grow, to eat the vegetables. And so that became the kind of hook for the book that I would follow a growing season in my garden here while this kind of uncertainty was going on around me. And to look at how gardens help us root ourselves in a place. So it was kind of exploring this idea of homesickness and uprooting, but through a bit more of a specific lens, which was the garden. So the jobs that I did in the garden, I found my mum's garden diary. So I put some of her jobs in there as well. And I explored some of the gardens nearby in Sussex that like famous gardens and talked about how gardens can feed creativity and how they can give us a sense of freedom and play yeah it started off as a different book and became much more focused on the garden yeah that's really interesting and I was going to ask you that question later on but I might as well come to it now when you did write about the gardens that you went to in your relatively local area did you pick those because they had interesting characters who lived in those gardens or did that come as a result of visiting the garden and then looking further into the people who'd been residents of the house and garden Yeah, that's a really good question. It was a bit of both, really. Charleston Garden is very near my house and I go there a lot. So that was more because I loved the garden, but I also loved the story of the place. So it was kind of the garden was my way into finding out more about the people that lived there. Sissinghurst, you know, it's such an incredible garden. So I really wanted to go there for the garden's sake. And then I found this really interesting story behind that. And Derek Jarman's garden, again, that was about well I guess it, in most cases it was both that I really wanted to unpick a bit more about the people who created those gardens and what did those gardens give them what kind of purpose were they serving in terms of their art and their well-being and I didn't know that much about Lee Miller so I learned a lot about her life when I was researching the garden at Farley House but the other ones I think I sort of knew a bit about the background But I was really intrigued to explore a bit more the kind of interplay between this idea of creativity and gardening. Mm. So I guess there are three aspects to the book, which is the kind of well-known gardens you visited. There was your garden where you were gardening. And then also, as you say, you found your mother's gardening diary. So you kind of punctuated the text with excerpts from her diary. What made you pick those specific ones? Was it because they were resonating with what you were doing in your garden at the time or were they more appropriate to the text that you were writing? How did that come about? Yeah, that was interesting because the diary is kind of odd. It's not chronological in the strict sense. So she does it by month. So she has all the jobs for March, but spread over like 15 years and then all the jobs for April spread over those 15 years. So it was a little bit hard to choose things because I was kind of flipping forward between the years, but I really wanted it to feel like I was walking in her footsteps. So she died at the same time that the eviction notice was given to us. So it was a really difficult time of great uncertainty and I was feeling very unmoored and destabilized, but it was lovely to feel that I was doing the same things in my garden that she had been doing. 
So it was more that I wanted to find things that gave a flavor of what I would be doing and what other readers would be doing in their gardens. I wanted it to feel relatable, but also this kind of sense of timelessness that gardens give us. So in any April over the last hundred years or even longer, someone would have been doing very similar things. And I, so it was more that I picked out things that felt like they spoke to this kind of universal timeless experience of gardens. And she didn't write in a lot of detail. They were very much just the job she was doing. She wasn't kind of observing things or remarking on them. So I didn't have to sort of elaborate on them. I just wanted to put them in exactly as she had written them. And do you think having that prompt, seasonal prompt of your mother's, do you think that helped focus you in your own garden? I don't know if it did in the same... I mean, I didn't sort of read it and think, oh, she was doing that, I better go and do it. It was more the other way around that... When I was noticing all my daffodils, I would remember her, she was obsessed with mowing her daffodils down when they'd finished blooming. And so I I would sort of remember things like that. It was more the other way around that I would think, oh yeah, mum used to do this. And I'd go back and check what she was doing at that point. But it was more like the memories of either doing things with her when we were little or her telling me about what she was doing as I was working in my garden and then going back to her diary and just looking through it and finding this sort of shared experience, even though she wasn't here anymore. And with your house that you were in, obviously you got the eviction notice. How long had you been there before you received that? Well, that was one of the tricky things about writing this book because it went on for a really long time. So we had been here about six years before that and the whole dispute went on for quite a long time, like several years. So I had to condense a lot of that into more manageable time frame for the book because who wants to hear like four years of me going on about the same thing but it really felt like our home my my youngest was one when we moved here I've got four kids and they were all at that kind of age where they spend a lot of time at home they spend a lot of time in the garden so it really felt like it was our family home and we t- took it on the understanding that it was a long-term rental we thought we would be here until they had grown up obviously you can never be sure of that but that was the sort of unspoken understanding that we had. So it was a real shock when we were told it was going on the market. Yeah, I bet it was. And I just wondered, reading the book, obviously, as you say, the garden had been your family garden and you'd spent a lot of time in it prior to this eviction notice. How did getting that notice change the way you gardened? At first, I just stopped completely because I thought, what's the point? And for a few months, I didn't bother with anything. I just let the weeds grow I was really preoccupied with trying to find somewhere else for us to live. And the house was already pretty dilapidated and just got more and more dilapidated. And then as the spring came after that, that was in the end of the summer. The next spring, I kind of thought, I just can't live like this. I can't live with this constant sense of everything just crumbling around me. And I decided the garden was going to be the way that I would change that, that I would have some sense of agency in this situation where I had absolutely no power. So. Then the garden became a place for me to work through all of those feelings of uprooting and worrying that my children were going to feel the same about this house that I had felt about the house that we had lost and, you know, feeling angry with myself for not giving them more stability and not being able to afford our own house. And so the garden became a place that I would kind of pour all of that stuff rather than the house itself. For some reason, it felt easier to be doing stuff outside and to try and create this beautiful, abundant place that we could all enjoy and just to believe that I would be there to harvest things. So yeah, it really changed from this kind of feeling of despondency and dejection into this feeling of defiance, just quietly defiant. It was really interesting what you wrote about the people, well, you did it yourself, but also other people kind of boomeranging back to their gardens that had been significant in previous times in their lives and you experienced that with that house as well and it's just the whole kind of idea of ownership and custodianship and the roots that we put down literally and metaphorically in a garden and I kind of thought okay obviously there are times that you feel rooted in a place and there are times when actually maybe the fates are telling you it's time to move on and hand over to another custodian Did you ever feel like there was a time, okay, maybe this is the time to leave this garden? Or did you really feel, you know, I must fight tooth and nail for this? That's so interesting because as I was reading and researching for the book, I really changed my mind about that. I thought, you know, I don't belong here any more than anyone else belongs here. And the garden doesn't care whether I'm here or not. 
And there was this really kind of strong sense of comfort in that, just like the, the ancientness of this bit of land and that it would just carry on without us, that no one really owns it. You know, the creatures that come in and out will come in and out, whatever happens. And that was really reassuring to me. And I think that we have a very kind of strange idea about property and land, particularly in the West, that we feel that we can make a hedge around it and no one will be allowed in. And that's our little bit of territory and we fiercely defend it. And I really understand that because that's very much how I felt at the beginning. But by the end of reading more and looking more at indigenous cultures and their attitude and this idea of custodianship and looking after the earth for the next generations, I really think I changed my mind about that. And I did let go of that feeling of having to hold on so tight to this place. And I felt if we have to move, you know, we will when we go, there will be bits of us that we've left in the garden, you know, physically bits of old plastic nerf guns and things but also the plants that I've grown and tended and there'll be those remnants for in the future and there's something really reassuring in that so yeah I think I did really change how I felt about it and I feel like I've got to a more healthy place about that obviously I don't want to draw any equivalence between what happened to us and you know the awful uprootings that are happening to people all over the world and refugees and people in exile and I'm not at all trying to say that my situation is like that but I do feel that perhaps by changing the way we feel about the land that we can help people to feel a sense of belonging wherever they land. Yeah and thinking about people who rent in a more practical sense Maybe there is a hesitance to spend money or time or effort in a garden that you don't own, but actually your book throws a different spin on that and says you kind of may be passing through, but it's still significant what you do in that space, which I think it does encourage people who maybe don't own a property or a garden to still look after it. Yeah, I think there's something about having beauty around you or even if you've only got a window box, you know, growing your own herbs that you can feed your family with. There's something about that that I feel is really important. And if you're not able to own your own house, there's no reason why you shouldn't also be able to enjoy that feeling of creating beauty and providing for yourself and opting out of the system where we have to pay lots of money for vegetables, which we can grow ourselves. And I think people who rent can also enjoy the space that they're in. I know it's much harder and I know money can be difficult and it's often, you know, you may just have, a tiny space but I think there's still things you can do I think there's still definitely a way that you can create other life and nurture the creatures around you and be part of the little ecosystem that you're in however big your outside space and I think you know you can just throw down a really cheap packet of annual seeds and they'll bloom you know that year and they'll look beautiful and if you're not there you could do it in your next place so there are ways to do it where you don't have to invest a huge amount of time and energy. And I know lots of people, you know, working really hard, they don't have lots of time, but I think there's always a way, however small, there's a way to create life and to sort of feel that you're giving back somehow to the land and the community that you're in. And actually, it's interesting, you mentioned about the food aspect, because I was wondering too, if maybe you feel a more significant attachment to a garden if you eat it I don't know whether that sounds a bit bonkers but the fact that you're kind of you know using that garden to create your own you know tissue does that create a deeper attachment I don't know yeah I think it probably does and I think the whole kind of lovely circularity of it so you grow a potato you peel it the peeling goes and the compost that goes back into the land and that lovely idea that it's all going round in circles so I think you can feel really connected to it in that way I always have these dreams of being completely self-sufficient and I know I manage like three beans or something (laughs) and one meal full of potatoes. So I can't provide for my family in terms of what I've managed to produce at all. But I love the fact that I can just go and have a fresh raspberry, you know, just straight off the bush or I can just go and pick some salad for lunch. It brings the garden inside, like literally inside. And the idea that you're filling yourself and your family or your friends and your loved ones with healthy things that you've grown I think that's just so beautiful yeah and I did also think it was almost as if you were slightly freed by the fact that you might have to move from the garden and that again made me think whether maybe there are advantages to being a more temporary or kind of tenuous occupier of a space that's interesting I think you're right I think I did come to a place of feeling much freer about our situation and much more 
kind of sure that wherever I am, I can make it feel like home. And I hadn't really felt like that before. So I think that situation did really teach me that. And I think through the garden, I learned that. And it was a hard lesson. It was difficult a lot of the time. But would I say I'm glad it happened? I'm not glad it happened, but I'm glad that I feel I've come out of it a different person. It must have been horrendously stressful because you had obviously that and losing your mother as well. But it was interesting because in the book, you kind of said, I've had losses before. I've had potentially more significant losses than what you faced with the eviction notice. And yet it really seemed to hit you and it seemed to present such a wrench. Mm. Was it just a kind of perfect storm of circumstances that made you feel, oh, you know, that I can't lose this house and garden. I really want to keep hold of this. What was it about that particular thing that was it just the timing of it that, that made it significant? No, I think it was this thing that it tapped into that loss that I'd had as a child of the house that I really loved. And that house really haunted me, partly, I think, because my parents split up. So that house represented my childhood, which was kind of abruptly ended when they split up. You know, we moved house and my family unit was different. So I think I attached a lot of meaning to that place because it was our last family home. But I just could not shake the sense that that house was mine and I had a right to it. And one day I would get it back. And I think I carried that wound for such a long time without really addressing it. And that's what I was trying to do in writing a book about home and belonging. I was trying to sort of tease that all out because I didn't want to carry it anymore. When I felt that I was repeating that for my kids, I felt this huge sense of disappointment in myself you know, frustration that I hadn't got myself in a better situation, this kind of sense of ancestral repetition. So my mum had a similar experience with her home and her mum never really had a home because she was a diplomat's wife and daughter and moved around a lot. So I felt like there was this thing that I was almost like bound to repeat this rupture. So yeah, I think that's why it had this unraveling effect on me because I felt that I was a failure and I was going to put my kids in a situation where they would feel about this house as I had felt about that other house. And I really needed to process all of that and try and understand what was going on a bit more. So yeah, I think that was it. That It felt like such a huge deal because it automatically took me back to that sense of loss that I had when I was 11. And do you think your children would have felt that sense of loss that you felt? Well, I don't think they actually would because I've spoken to them. I mean, they haven't read the book. They've sort of picked it up, vaguely interested, but, you know, they'll never sit down and read it. But I did talk to them about it as I was writing it. And one of them said, oh, it would have been really exciting to move. And I thought, oh, God, I've been here, like, struggling and fighting to preserve us. But actually, you probably would have been fine. And that, again, was quite a relief because... Their situation is not the same as mine and they would have been fine. My daughter did say that because she was very little when this was all happening. And I think she said she'd been crying at night time a lot and worrying about it, but didn't want to say anything. But that may have been because, you know, she could pick up on my stress. I'm not sure. But no, I think they would have been OK. I, I think we would have ended up in a much smaller, much more cramped place. So that might have been difficult for them. But no, I don't think all the things I was worrying about and kind of catastrophizing about would have happened. This is a bit of a weird question. Do you ever dream about, because uh, when I dream, I'm, I'm asking this because I do it a lot or not so much now, but I used to. I was always, always, if I was in a house in my dream, in my childhood home, and I've read that a lot of people kind of do that. Did you ever dream about your childhood home? Yeah, I dreamt about it a lot. I imagined how I would redecorate it when I finally got it back. I, yes, very much what I was really interested in in this book is thinking about childhood homes and particularly childhood gardens because they offer us such a space to be free and often we are not being watched all the time when we're out there so it's the one place that we can you know just do what we want without grown-ups bothering us and we can make dens and we can hide and we can create these little homes for ourselves out there so I was really interested in that idea of how we carry these kind of echoes of our childhood homes and our childhood gardens into the places that we live now. But I don't dream about that house anymore, actually. I haven't thought about it. I haven't dreamt about it for a really long time. 
funny, isn't it? But I mean, that's interesting that you say that because as a child, you're obviously learning about the cycles of life and death and birth and ageing and all the rest of it growing up. And maybe the garden is the perfect place to play that out. And I got that impression from your book that you had played out lots of things through the garden whilst you were gardening, you know, in your head and come to terms with a lot of things that were going on. Why are they so good gardens, do you think, at helping us cope with emotions and just making sense of life in general? I think they can operate on us on different levels. So there's a lot more scientific research now showing the actual physical changes that happen to us while we're outdoors or in a green space or putting our hands into soil and, you know, the oils that are released from trees and the way that being outdoors can just impact on our well-being generally is being much more understood. So I think that's one of those aspects that we just feel better when we're outdoors in a natural space. And working the soil releases microbes that increase our sense of well-being. So all of those things, I think, are at play. And I think also there's a, a quiet meditativeness to a lot of the jobs that you're doing out there that enables you to just get into a sense of kind of happy flow of thought where you're not really thinking, but you are thinking, you're working through stuff as you're maybe, you know, digging out dandelions or potting on some seedlings. There's a, there's a kind of slowness to work out there that I think encourages that sense of reflection. And yeah, I think there is this sense of the ongoingness of nature that things will change. It's constantly in flux. The garden is never the same from one moment to the next. And that's very energizing and very reassuring because we're just tiny, tiny parts in this really massive system and this big sense of time. I found like that was so conducive to thinking and thinking about my place in the world as I was out here doing these little jobs and thinking of all the other people who'd worked that land before me and who will work it in the future. And so I think they operate on all these different levels. I think that's why they're so great. And you know, sometimes yeah, I cannot face going out and doing the weeding. I'm not saying I always feel enraptured when I'm out in my garden, but there's something about working out there that just brings on this state of reflection and just happiness. It's just lovely. It's sometimes just the loveliest thing. I just walked past one of my roses today and got this huge waft of amazing scent. And, you know, moments like that when you just think, oh, everything's all right, because I can just stand here and be enveloped in these amazing smells and listen to the swifts overhead and for that moment everything was good. A really big thank you to Lula for talking about her book and thank you to you as always for listening. I hope you find the same solace from a green space and that it provides you with comfort during the good times and bad. Dr Ian Bedford is here now talking about something that I have absolutely no doubt of, that bugs have feelings too. During 2006, Britain's Animal Welfare Act came into force, imposing a duty on the keepers of vertebrate animals to ensure their welfare and making it an offence to cause them suffering. And as a consequence, we've seen a vast improvement in the welfare of animals that we farm for food, keep as pets and use for various work purposes. However, until recent years, our interpretation of an animal's feelings towards others and its environment relied on assumptions that were based on how we would feel under similar situations. But nowadays, advancements in science and technology enables us to delve much deeper into the biological processes that sustain an animal's life and reveal species that we believe, beyond reasonable doubt, experience emotions such as joy, pleasure, pain and fear. Species that we call sentient animals, with elephants, dolphins, dogs and pigs being some of the first to be listed, to more recent ones such as chickens, rats and fish. And now, with science-based evidence that octopus, squid, crab and lobster should be assumed as sentient, more humane ways to process them as food are being proposed. So with these marine invertebrates demonstrating that it's not just the more highly evolved animals that feel emotions, should we perhaps be wondering about other invertebrates? And how might it affect us if we found that the bugs we often kill without a second thought also experienced emotion? 
Could it perhaps change our whole perception of the natural world? And as someone who's studied bugs for most of my life, I do wonder, especially since throughout the world, we currently persecute bugs more than any other animal and have been killing them in phenomenal numbers, with reports that pesticides eradicate about 3,500 trillion on North American crops each year and 33 trillion on their roads. But whether we choose to accept it or not, scientific research is finding that certain insects could indeed have an ability to experience emotion, and the evidence for this is continuing to mount. With research that's found, amongst many other things, bees that buzz with delight at pleasant surprises, or sink into depression when bad things happen, and fruit flies that watch and learn from their peers. But what's intriguing is that these findings are not just based on behavioural observations, but are corroborated by quite extraordinary studies on the workings of an insect's brain, identifying areas that perform similar functions to our brains, where levels of dopamine and serotonin change in response to environmental stresses. But what's now being discovered through modern day science might just be something that many of us have already suspected after watching the antics of bugs in our gardens. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.